Open your Bibles to the book of Galatians this morning. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. We are um, going through the book of 1 Timothy typically on Sunday mornings. Yeah, if you need a Bible, you don't have one, raise your hand, we'll get one to you. Uh, also, um, you can open up your Version Bible app if you have that, and you can follow along under the events, under Version events. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we're going through 1 Timothy together, uh, but today we're going to do a little bit of a special message. It's our anniversary. Uh, we're celebrating four years, and so I just wanted to kind of take some time to just talk about us as a church and uh, use uh, a section out of Galatians chapter 3 uh, and verses 10 through 14 together today. Every day, most of us travel at dangerously high speeds, threatening even our very lives, coming inches away from certain death, trusting a little yellow line to save us. You, you realize you do that as you're driving down the road? That, that there is almost nothing keeping another car from going over that yellow line and coming right into you, right? And yet we just, we kind of don't think about it for the most part. For the most part, we just drive along and don't even really realize that we're doing that. We just drive along and, and, uh, and, and put our faith in this little yellow line uh, to save us. We exercise our faith in a lot of ways in our lives, maybe in, in more ways than we even realize that we're exercising faith. Uh, and, and today, as we celebrate our four-year anniversary as a church, I want to take the opportunity to cast some vision for you concerning the mission of Redemption Calvary and why it is that we exist. And so we're going to be looking at that together today. Redemption Calvary exists to grow healthy followers of Jesus by increasing biblical literacy and biblical obedience. Now, if you want to write that down, you can, or you can take your program and turn it over, and it's written down for you right there. Uh, that, that's just, it's something that is really important for us. It's something that it really drives everything that we do, because really the truth is that what you need most in life is you need to know the scriptures. Because if you know the Bible, then you're going to come to know the God of the Bible. And when you know the God of the Bible, he will radically transform who you are. That's just what he does. He calls us into obeying him, and in obeying him, our lives are transformed. And, and while this concept is all over Scripture, we're going to focus our attention together today in Galatians chapter 3 to take a look at that and how this unfolds for us in this section of Scripture. Here's our big idea as we look at Galatians 3 together today. It's this, that everybody has faith, but not everybody has saving faith. Everybody has faith, but not everybody has saving faith. So let's read Galatians 3, 10 through 14 together. It says this, for as many are, as many as of, are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we open your word together, we pray that you would give us open hearts and open minds. You would give us the ability to understand what it is that your word says and that you would clearly apply it to us, that we would know you, that we would love you, and that our lives would reflect that reality. And we realize that as we declare our love for you, that, that that's only possible because you first loved us. That Jesus, you declared your love to us in uh, the most tangible and extravagant way by going to the cross willfully for us. And we pray that you would help us to uh, be impacted by that reality, by that message, by that gospel message today, and that you would transform us into your image more and more. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, as we look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, we're going to take it in two parts. Verses 10 through 12, faith in my ability, and then verses 13 through 14, faith in Jesus' ability. Now, all people are a people of faith. That may strike you as a strange statement, but it's absolutely true. 
All people are a people of faith. Even people who claim to be atheists, even people who claim that they don't believe in anything, that is still something that is an exercise of a measure of faith. That statement to say, I don't believe in anything, it's actually a faith statement. It's a statement of belief. Their belief in nothing is a belief in and of itself. That, that, it, there is no way around being a people of faith. It's how we've been hardwired by God. Now, the, the thing is that even though that's a statement of faith, it's just a bad statement of faith. It's a, it's a terrible belief because it disagrees with reality. And so whenever our faith disagrees with reality, we have a problem with what's going on in our lives. Now, there are those who say that they can't trust in something unless they understand it entirely. You know, I'm not going to trust in this. I'm not going to put my faith in this. I'm not going to believe in it unless it just makes sense and I can put it all together. And, and while I sort of understand understand that idea, it actually flies in the face of and is a false premise to how people actually live their lives. Like, tell me this, do you know how your heater works? Probably not. Like, there's maybe one or two HVAC guys that, that know how that thing actually works, but most of us have no clue, and yet we trust it to keep us alive during the winter, right? Uh, we, we, I, I don't know how my engine works, but there's small explosions going on inside that thing, and uh, I'm not dead, you know? Like, I'm trusting that thing all the time. My refrigerator, my, uh, I, you know, my heater, uh, my uh, oven, you know, that thing is a, a, a bomb waiting to happen at any moment, uh, especially if I'm cooking. Um, you, you put your faith in, every time you get on an airplane, you, you put your faith in the pilot. That you don't know how, do you know how to fly a plane? Probably not. Do you know how the, all of the, the, the laws of flight work and all that stuff? No, but you trust, you put your faith in that pilot. That pilot. You trust every night when you go to bed, you put your faith in the idea that you're going to wake up again. Do you know how sleep works? Do you know why it happens? Do you know what's going on while you're sleeping? Absolutely not. And yet, you put your faith in that. Even the thought that says, I can't understand something, or I can't believe something unless I understand it altogether, that's putting faith in your mind, which you don't even understand how that works. You have no idea how your mind works at all. And so that entire premise, it's a false premise that people try to put up. It's a straw man argument to say, I just can't believe something unless I understand it completely. It's a straw man argument that seems wise, but it's actually foolish. It actually isn't the way that anybody lives their lives. In fact, we believe things and we trust things all over the place in our lives that are, uh, that are constantly happening because faith's not a foreign practice to anyone who has ever lived on this planet. You see, the thing that matters, it's not the sincerity of your faith. It's not even the amount of your faith. It's the object of your faith. That's what matters. The object of your faith is what matters of utmost importance. And sadly, many people choose to put their faith in something or someone other than Jesus. And that falls short of saving faith. So let's look at verses 10 through 12 together this morning. And this first thought, faith in my ability. Read verse 10 with me again, if you would. It says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, Curses everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You see, the entire point of the book of Galatians, which is where we find ourselves, is to unveil the truth that religious activity is never enough to produce righteousness. That's what Galatians is all about. There's no amount of good stuff you can do. There are no amount of good works that you can do. There's the, you can't walk enough old ladies across the street or donate enough money or adopt enough uh, stray animals in order to be able to uh, gain God's approval of your life. There's just no amount of stuff you can do to get in the good category before God. That It's just not possible. That's the point of Galatians, uh, the book that's written there. Now, in the middle of this, of chapter 3, Paul here, the author of Galatians, the human author, we know that the Holy Spirit is the author, but the human author, Paul, he here quotes four Old Testament verses to point the Galatian believers and us toward this truth of biblical literacy and biblical obedience. He's calling them into biblical literacy. He's saying, look, here's what the Bible actually says. And you need to put your faith in this. You need to obediently follow the Lord in this. You see, we don't worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible is primarily revealed through the Bible. That's why we study it. 
Right? We don't exalt it. This is just ink on a page, but it's something a lot more than that, isn't it? Because this, this represents the eternal living Word of God. Even though it's just a book, it's so much more than that. It's not just, uh, just a book. It's, it's, it's something much more than that because it's God's manifestation or revealing of Himself to us. Now, we don't, we don't exalt the Bible above due, its due position, but we do exalt it to an extremely high place because in it, God is revealed. And that's why we study the Scriptures the way that we do. That's why here at Redemption Calvary, we go through books of the Bible together. You're not going to hear topical messages about you know, five ways to be a better this, that, or the other thing. You're just not going to hear that because that's not what you need. What you need is to understand what the Bible says. And when you understand what the Bible says, you understand who God is. And that will radically transform your life. I know that's what it did for me. I know that's what it's done for countless other people that I know. Now, there in verse 10, it says, as many as. Do you see that there in verse 10? For as many as. That, that, what that is referring to is people and what they do with their faith. Essentially what this is doing is it's drawing a line in the sand and it's saying that there are, there, everybody has faith and some people use their faith to put their faith in their own abilities. They're saying, my, I'm, I'm putting my trust in my own abilities. Some people use the law as a way to sort of bargain with God. You ever done that? God, if, if I do this, you're going to come through for me in this way, right? That, that's a, just a tendency that we have, don't we? I, I think almost all of us have probably had some sort of conversation with God like that. And it's a legalistic, law-driven way to have a relationship with God. I'll perform for you if you perform for me. And some people actually use this as a way to sort of hold God hostage. I came through on my side, God. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you give me my thing? Why didn't you do this stuff for me? I've been, I've been a good boy. I've done all the right things. I, I've, I've uh, done, you know, done the stuff that you said I should do. Why aren't you coming through for me? And, and the truth is that uh, when I talk to God that way or when I feel that way, I'm feeling entitled that I, I should have access to some sort of uh, blessing from God. But the truth is that's just not how God works. That's not how any relationship works. I mean, just take that and apply it to your wife, man. What if you talk to your wife that way? Well, you're going to get punched in the face, right? That's probably what's going to happen. Like, no, you know, I took out the trash. Where's my dinner, woman? Like, well, it just doesn't work that way, you know? She's going to say, well, you better drive down to Chick-fil-A because you're, you're going to get nothing from me, you know? Um, it's just not how relationships work. And we tend to kind of treat God that way, don't we? It's just ridiculous. That's just, not, that's just not good relationship. And so here to combat that idea, uh, Paul quotes in chapter uh, verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, he quotes Deuteronomy 27, 26. And that's what we have written there. Cursed is everyone who doesn't continue in all things that are written in the book. Essentially, what's happening here is, is he's quoting this verse because this mentality can never produce right standing before God. It always ends in a curse. If that's the wet route you're going to go, if you think that fulfilling the law is going to, that's what I'm just going to do my thing, I'm going to do the letter of this, I'm going to fulfill my standard of this, I'm going to do my part of this, and that's going to obligate God to then come through for me, it's never going to end in righteousness. It's only going to end in curse. That's the only way it ever, ever ends. Now, the word curse there, I mean, you, maybe you read that, you're like, whoa, is that like witches and, you know, cauldrons and brews and stuff like that? Like, what is going on here, this idea of a curse? It, don't think so much like that when you think of the word curse. This is the idea of damnation or trouble or evil that is, is projected against a person. Uh, and so it sort of carries that idea, I guess. But really, this is, what this is talking about is how humanity was plunged into a curse in Genesis chapter 3. That, that when Adam and Eve decided that they were going to eat of that fruit, which probably wasn't an apple, it was probably actually a tomato. I got a whole theory for you as to why, but because um, they're wrong. They're wrong. Why would anybody eat that junk? Um, it's only purified through cooking and turning into salsa and ketchup and things like that. Anyway, um, so <laughs> dumb. Anyway, so that, that moment when Adam and Eve chose that, it had nothing to do with the fruit, right? You get that? 
It wasn't like, you know, pears are bad or something like that. It had everything to do with the choice. And the choice was to say, I don't want your way, God. I want my own way. And when we choose our own way, you know what happens? We get plunged into a curse. And since then, since Adam and Eve, our first parents, every single person in human history has been born under this curse. The moment that you are conceived in your parents' womb, you are born, you are delivered, you are created, you are made under that curse. And that's the way that humanity lives. At the fall of humanity is when this curse took place. But the truth is that we've got to look at history from that perspective, going all the way back to Genesis. Otherwise, we don't understand history correctly, and we don't understand our place in history correctly. Because history is only rightly understood as redemptive history. That's the only right way to look back at history and understand it. You look, you look back and you see that God is in perfection and he creates the world and the universe in perfection. And then at that catastrophic, cataclysmic event, when sin enters the world, the fall comes into existence and wrecks human history. And the curse comes as a result of the fall. But then Jesus Christ comes on the scene, goes to the cross, pays the penalty by his blood, by his death, by, by his burial. Three days later, he rises from the dead, proving once and for all that he in fact is God. He has the ability to pay for sin and to deliver eternal life and that we have salvation in him and the hope of future glorification in heaven. If you don't understand history in those terms, you don't understand human history. You're going to look back at it and you're going to see a bunch of things, some good, some bad, some crazy, some that don't make sense whatsoever, and it's not going to have a right standing unless you understand it in the, the category of redemptive history. You see, the curse that was pronounced on uh, Adam and Eve is the same curse that we live under today. And it's pronounced on anyone, notice there in verse 10, who does not continue in all the law to do it. That, that there's... Essentially, what, what, what this is saying is there's no participation trophies, right? Like my, uh, my nephew, uh, he really loves soccer, but he's just not an athlete. Um, he's just, he likes soccer because he likes to walk on the little white line. And he likes to high-five all the other kids at the end of the game and get a juice box. Like, that's why he likes soccer. He doesn't understand the idea of, of crushing the enemy, you know, like he doesn't get that idea. There's no, there's no competitive drive within him. And so he's like, yeah, I just love soccer. It's so good. The grass is cool. It's warm. And like, he just, he'll chase the ball sort of, but like, he just isn't engaged in it. And he gets, he got a trophy at the end of his soccer season, right? And here you, here you go, buddy. Like there are no participation trophies in life, just so that you know, it's not, I knew that there was a law. I tried really hard to do my best. I think, I think I did a pretty good job. My good outweighs my bad. There's no participation trophies with the Lord. It is either all or nothing. That's the way it works with God. Look at verse 11. It says this. Uh, it says that, uh, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. You see, there's this self-evident truth that everyone intuitively understands. But there's also a deceptive religious allure that blinds us to the reality of this. That it's tempting us to put our faith in ourselves even though we know it's misplaced faith. You, do you know that you're, you fail? Do you know that you're not always perfect? Do you know that you just, like sometimes even if you try really hard and you really want to do well, you still fail anyway? That thought in and of itself is enough to help you know you cannot keep God's law. Before you even knew there was a law, you already failed. You already broke it. And so that, that should just be this self-evident truth. And yet, and yet we, we are blinded to this reality by thinking that somehow this religious practice is going to save me. Habakkuk 2.4. Did you know there was a Habakkuk in the Bible? You're like, how do, you, what, how do you say that thing? Yeah, there's a Habakkuk in the Bible. Chapter 2, verse 4, that's quoted there. Paul knew the Bible so well, he's quoting places that you didn't even know existed. And so he's there, he's, qu he's quoting this to support this as truth. Now, in Habakkuk 2.4, it talks about the just living by faith. Do you see that there in verse 11? The just shall live by faith. The word just is that God has declared you as righteous. That's what just is. And there's only two ways to get this righteousness. 
One is, on your own, fulfill all the law for all your life. Never slip up, never make a mistake, never accidentally do something that was wrong, never purposefully do something that was wrong. That's one way. The other way is for someone else to give you their righteousness. That's the other way. Leviticus 11.45 says this, For I, the Lord, am the one who brought you up out of, out of the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. Therefore, look at this part, you must be holy because I am holy. You see the standard that God puts there? That's the standard of perfection. He says, you must be holy. Not you've got to like holiness, not that you've got to try for holiness, not that you've got to appreciate holiness, not that you've got to recognize God's holiness, but you must be holy. Does that freak anybody out? That, it just, when I think about that, I think, Lord, I am, I am completely incapable of doing anything close to that on my best day. How in the world is this even possible? You see, God's standard is for us to be holy as He is. Not not our standard of holiness, but as holy as He is. It's not enough to agree with Him or really try hard or even want to be holy. We've got to be holy. And so He calls us to this. But then verse 12 really drives the nail home for us and slams the door shut if we ever thought we had a chance at this. He says, yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. You see, this simple statement that keeping the law and living by faith are not the same thing just shuts the door completely. If we, if we thought there was a crack and maybe I was gonna, there's a loophole and I'm going to find a way through this, it, there is no possible way because the law is faith in self. That's what the law is. If you think you're going to fulfill God's law, you're putting your faith in yourself. And that is misplaced faith because you're not perfect. Because of, your, because of your inability to be perfect, you cannot fully keep the law. But that doesn't change God's standard, right? Just because I can't do it doesn't mean that God doesn't still demand it. When I break God's law, it doesn't prove the law to be bad, right? You, you, ever, you ever try to do that with a cop? You know, they pull you over for, you know, you're going too fast or whatever, and, or you ran over someone's cat or something. I, I don't, praise the Lord if you did. I mean, don't, I, don't quote me on that. But like, you're just driving along, you know, and you're, you broke the law. Maybe you didn't even know you did. And, and the, the cop pulls you over, and, and he says, hey, do you, know, do you know what you did? And you genuinely, you know, not, not lying like most of you probably, not, not you people, other people do. Um, no, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. <laughs> you genuinely don't know. And he's like, hey, well, you were, you were going 95 in a 25. <laughs> Off. I didn't realize that was the speed limit. Okay, well, does that ignorance get you out of the ticket? Negative. You still broke the law. Does you breaking the law make the law bad? Some of you are like, yeah, it should be like a 95 mile an hour speed, speed limit zone. No, the law, the law is still good, even if you broke it. Your breaking of the law proves the law to be good, not bad. It proves you to be bad. That's what it does. Does that make sense? So that's what he's saying to us here. That, that it's, it's not that, I, it's not that I, I break the law and it makes the law bad. It, makes, it means that I agree with the law that it's good. Here's how Skip Heitzig says it. The straight edge of the law shows the crookedness of my life. That's what it does. When you measure yourself against the standard of God's holiness and his perfection, it clearly shows you as crooked all over the place. It doesn't show you as awesome. If you read the law and you think I'm awesome, you read it wrong, right? Like that's not the way to read that. Now here in verse 11, Leviticus 18.5 is what's quoted here. And basically what it's showing us is that it's not enough to just know the law, to agree with the law, or even like it. The standard is actually to do the law. James 2.10 says it like this, For the person who keeps all the law except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. That's a crazy standard, isn't it? Now, the Jewish people, as they went through the Old Testament, they found that there were 613 laws. If you were to keep 612 of these 613 laws from the time that you were born, and you just broke that one law, that one law judges you as guilty. 
With God, it's pass, fail. And 100% for 100% of your life is the only passing score there is. You see, you failed at breaking more than one of these laws before you even knew there was a law. And so bef- you're, you're already lost. You're already, you're already broken. You're already without hope. And aren't you glad that there's more verses? Because if we just read this, we would be stuck with, what do I do now? How could I ever have hope to, I, I, should, I should just do something to try to work my way up to God. And yet, there are more verses for us. And I thank God so much for that. Because for, verse 13 picks up with a new idea. Not just uh, faith in my ability, but faith in Jesus' ability. Look at verse 13 with me, if you would. It says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You see, some people actually believe that they can keep and have kept the law. And what they do is they fail to see that the purpose of the law is, is, is that they think it's there to declare them as holy, not to show them the crookedness of their life. But 1 Timothy 1.8 tells us, we just went over this a, a few weeks ago in, in our study through 1 Timothy. It says this, we know that the law is good when it's used correctly. right? When you use the law correctly, it's good. The goodness of the law is to show the standard of holy perfection that God has and to show us that we are not like Him. And that drives us not to exalt ourselves, but to the end of ourselves. To say that I don't have what it takes. And then Galatians 3.24 in the same chapter, a little bit later on, it says this, Therefore the law was our tutor, notice, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Justified by by faith. You see, the law, has, the law of God has two specific intentions. To declare the holy perfection of God and to reveal our utter inability to be holy. you got to think of the law sort of like James describes it like a mirror. Think of it like a mirror. That, that when you look into the Word of God, you look into the law and the standard of God, it's like a mirror. It'll show you all the dirtiness of your life. It'll, it'll clearly reveal to you all of the depravity that you have, all of the filth that is on you. But, but where, where the, the mirror stops is it actually cleaning you, right? The, the mirror can show you that, but it can't clean you. All it can do is say, you need the shower of Jesus. And you got to get under the flow of his blood to cleanse you from unrighteousness, to cleanse you from unholiness to cause you to literally become holy, just as holy as God is. That's the crazy thing about Jesus, that that his blood was spilled on your behalf to cover your sin, to wash away your sin, and that when God looks at you under the blood of Christ, he doesn't see your failure. He doesn't see your brokenness. He doesn't see all of the things that you did that that, uh, violated him. He sees Jesus when he looks at you. Isn't that an amazing thing? I'm so glad that God doesn't see me and all my failure and all my stupidity and all the the wrong things that I've done and all the faithlessness and all the the ways that I've violated other people and hurt them and taken advantage of people and blasphemed him and and just lived as a fool. But he sees me as Jesus. What an amazing thing. How do you get that? Well, it only comes by faith. That's the only way you get it. It's to accept that truth and reality and actually believe in it. Actually rest your faith in it. Actually trust in it. It's only when I'm willing to see myself as sinful and filthy and dirty and a violation of God's law, then I will see, be willing to see my need for Jesus' blood. If I don't think it's that bad, then I'm going to say, well, I just don't really need Jesus. There's really not a, He was a nice guy. I mean, he said some cool stuff, I guess, but there's no real, I don't need Jesus because I'm pretty good. As long as you think you're pretty good, you will not see your need for Jesus. You see, this is where hope comes to the rescue from from the condemnation that we deserve under God's law because of our inability to perfectly keep it. Notice there in verse 13, it says that he redeemed us. Christ, this is Jesus, he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You see, this idea of redeemed is the idea of being rescued that you've been rescued. It's almost like, it's like, think if, if you were out in the middle of the ocean and you're drowning and uh, you've got to be, you gotta, you've, there's no way for you to save yourself and the Coast Guard shows up and they pull you out of the waves. But it's more than that. It's not just rescued. 
It's rescued at a price. It's, it's, think of it more like you were rescued, but the, the guy that tried to rescue you, he died in your place rescuing you. It's that, that there was a price that was paid in order to save your life. That's what Jesus did. He, he gave his life for the sake of yours. It's the redeemed is to be rescued at a price. It's to be purchased and set free. That's the idea of being redeemed. You see, the justice of God demands that your sin is not okay. God's not, I don't know if you, how you view God, but he, don't think like big, fat, bearded guy in the sky like Santa just going, it's okay, wink, you know? Like that's, that's not who God is. Your sin's not okay. It's, he's not just like that, that nice grandpa that says, do whatever you want, kids. It's okay. That is not who God is. His justice demands that bloodshed come as a result of your sin. That's what it demands. That, that the things that you've done are actually worse than you think they are. The thoughts that you have that drive you away from the Lord are actually worse than you think they are. The, the, the desires and intentions of your heart are worse than you think they are. They, they demand the blood of someone perfect, sinless, and holy. And only Jesus is qualified for such a thing. Write down, if you would, we were going to turn there, but we don't have time. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. You see, here's the reality. You are only able to be seen as redeemed and as righteous because Jesus became a curse for you. Isn't that what it says there in, in Galatians? You see, in, in Romans 8, it says, you are not, there is no, no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your sin, the, the failure of your life, the filthiness of your life, deserves condemnation. It deserves condemnation. And yet Romans 8 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? Because verses 2 and 3 say, Jesus became a curse. Jesus took the condemnation. When Jesus was on the cross, he endured the wrath and hatred of God against sin, against your sin, for you. That's what Jesus did. And so because Jesus paid that price, you're no longer seen as condemned, you're going to be seen as just as righteous as God, just as righteous as Jesus is. <clears throat> what an amazing truth and amazing reality. Now here in, in uh, verse 13 of Galatians, we see that Deuteronomy 21, 23 is quoted. And this was a, a common kind of a, a, this idea of the cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now this was not a common practice for the Jewish people. They didn't execute people by hanging them on trees and, and that kind of thing, but it was seen as this, this immensely terrible thing. You see, the people actually believed that there was a fate worse than death. We don't really believe that in our culture today, that death is kind of the worst thing ever. They believed there was something actually worse than death, that when your body, when you died, that they would parade your body or they would hang it up as a, as a trophy of dishonor and disgrace, that that was actually worse. And so they, this idea of hanging on a tree and that being a curse that was stated thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up and foreshadowing his death, his condemnation, his curse that he took on your behalf. You see, the cross, it's not an unfortunate ending to an otherwise really great story of a nice Hebrew guy that lived a long time ago and did some cool stuff. But he was oh, so sad. He was, those mean Romans killed him and those, those terrible Jews, they... they, uh, they forsook him and they they were a traitor against him like that's that's not if you if that's the way you read the bible if that's what you think about the gospel you don't understand the gospel it wasn't them they didn't they didn't kill jesus jesus said i give my life up freely and you know why he did because of you not them you your sin your failure your depravity that's what put jesus on the cross and it's his love that kept him there to pay the price for your sin. He loved you that much. That's a crazy kind of love you've never experienced before. And that love should pierce your heart and cause you to come to the end of yourself. You see, it wasn't that it was an unfortunate thing that took place. It was his plan from the beginning because he knew it was the only way to redeem you. Now, verse 14, we see it says, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see, these four verses paint an extremely clear biblical picture of redemptive history. That God is perfect, 
the four verses that, were, that, that he referenced, right, that, that Paul was quoting, they paint a, a clear picture of the biblical, of, of redemptive history. That God's perfect and we're not and our only hope to be rescued and to be redeemed is if somebody else steps in. And that someone did. His name's Jesus. He did step in. And the blessing that Abraham has here in verse 14 is the blessing of faith of trusting in God. That's what Abraham is known. He's known as the father of faith. And the reason he's known as that is because God came to him and said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And through the blessing that I bless you with, you're going to bless everybody else. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. <coughs> and Abraham was just crazy enough to actually trust God to actually believe God. And the way it played out in Abraham's life specifically was that God gave him a miraculous son. That he and his wife Sarah were barren. They couldn't have any kids. And God waited until they were, I think he was in his 90s and she was in her late 80s. Can you imagine that? Like having babies at that age? Oh my goodness. Like having kids is a young man's game. I am so glad my wife and I are done. I can't imagine, try, like, I'm not, I'm not even quite 40 yet. And I can't imagine starting over with a baby right now. That just seems bananas to me. Uh, let alone at 80 years old or 90 years old. That's just a crazy, crazy idea. And yet Abraham believed God. <coughs> Excuse me. And so out of that idea of Abraham's belief, through that son, Isaac, who was born, came the lineage of Jesus. So it's not just Isaac. That's not all it is. It's faith not only in, in that son that would be born, but it's faith in God's future provision of salvation. That's the faith of Abraham. And that's why when we exercise faith in Jesus, we're adopted into Abraham's family. We're children of faith. That's who we get to be. Uh, Romans 4, 20 through 21 says it like this. Abraham never, wa uh, never wavered in believing in God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in, his, uh, in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do whatever he promises. Notice it says there he, that Abraham wasn't convinced that God was able to do whatever Abraham made up and told God to do. He was fully convinced that God could do whatever God promised. That's where your faith is rightly placed, is in what God says. Not your, you don't rub God like a magic genie and, and say, do whatever I say, God, and that's going to make you awesome. Or, you know, treat God like a pinata and prayer's the stick. You know, you whack God with the stick hard enough and then good things fall out. That's not, that's not how God works. But that's how a lot of people view faith. That's how a lot of people view God in relationship with him. And they're like, man, I whacked the pinata, but nothing good fell out. God must be broken. That, that's not true. The reality is your faith's in the wrong thing. You're putting your faith in you in that moment. You're not putting your faith in what God has said. You've got to listen to what God says and put your faith in that. That's real faith. That's genuine faith. You see, Abraham's blessing was trusting God for a son, and that was the lineage that Jesus came from. It's, it's his example of faith, but it's also the salvation that was to come. And Abraham's blessing of faith is accessible. Notice it says there that Abraham's, uh, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Now, for you and me, that may not make any sense. It may not, you know, you're like, whatever, what is, that, that's not a big deal. Gentiles is a big deal, especially for a Jewish mind. Because in this day and age, there's only two kinds of people. There's Jews and there's not Jews, right? Je not Jews is Gentile. So everybody else, which is probably almost all of us, right? There's, there's Jews and then there's everybody else. What this is saying is that the same blessing that God specifically gave and chose to give to Abraham as the founder and father of the Jewish people is accessible to everybody else. And the only way it's accessible is by placing your faith in Jesus and his substitutionary death for you. That he died on the cross for your faith. You see, the truth is that faith is the obedience that the Bible demands. When the Bible calls us to obedience, the very first obedience is faith. And every other obedience flows from that faith obedience. You see, that, that faith produces obedient action in your life because biblical literacy always produces biblical obedience. If you actually understand the Bible, you will always obey it. The problem that you have when you sin, the problem that you have when you fail, is you don't actually believe what the Bible says. You think you do. You, you think you, read, you can read the verse, you can quote the verse or whatever, but something's disconnected from your heart and mind. 
You don't actually understand what the Bible says if you don't, actually, if you don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, you're not going to obey it. You see, Jesus isn't merely a nice guy, a moral teacher, or a great example. Saving faith in Jesus is confirmed by the Holy Spirit moving within your life. That's why it says there at the end of verse 14, the promise of the Spirit comes into us through faith. The same Spirit that, it, that empowered Jesus to live perfect and holy and perform miracles is, is alive and well within the heart of a believer. That, that, that when you put your faith in Jesus to save you, His Holy Spirit moves right into your life. And that is the seal of your salvation. Colossians 1, 27 through 28 says this, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the, is the Holy Spirit. That's what it's talking about. Him we preach, Jesus we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that, here's why, we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You need to hear Jesus preached. You need to experience relationship with Jesus. You need to have his spirit move into you to empower you to not just live a life chasing after your things, exalting yourself, uh, maybe depraved and, and just living like the, the, the schmuck next door or whatever. Like you've got to have Jesus fill you to make you different, to make you different redeemed and unique and, and have a life of eternal significance, not just living for here and now, not just living for a good time, but living for a good legacy. Only Jesus can do that. And he does it by moving into your life. You see, the Spirit of God that empowered the humanity of Jesus to fulfill the law and live holy is in the believer. And if godliness is not being produced in your life, it's because of lack of faith in Jesus. And if godliness is being produced in your life, it's only through faith in Jesus. You don't graduate from that, right? Like you don't get into Christ by believing in Jesus. And that's, okay, now I, all right, thanks Lord for doing that for me. Now I'm going to figure this thing out for, on my own. I'm just going to white knuckle my way through my Christianity. I'm just going to really hold on to this thing. And I'm just, I'm going to pull myself up. And Nike says, just do it. And I'm just going to do it. You know, like, no, that is not biblical Christianity. The same faith that saves you is the faith that sanctifies you or, or causes you to grow in Christ. It's continuing to develop that faith in Jesus. In 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, again, write this down. We don't have time to, to turn there. I really want to, but we don't have time. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. It tells the story of this, this kid, and it's kind of an obscure story. His name is Mephibosheth. And when you read it, you're going to be like, yeah, whatever. Okay, so just whatever you insert in there is cool. But there's this kid named Mephibosheth. And he's got this crazy story. When he was a young, when he was a young boy, um, his, uh, his family dynasty was the, the family of Saul. And Saul was the first king of Israel. And when Saul died, the common practice in that day and age was when the king dies, you wipe out his entire family. And the, that way, when the, the kingdom shifts the reign to somebody else because David was going to be king next and David wasn't of the family of Saul. And so the common practice was that everybody in that family would be slain, would be just murdered so that nobody could, nobody could say that they had a, a right to the throne. And in this, uh, Mephibosheth's uh, like nanny, she realized this, so she tried to run away with him. And, and in the process of running away, uh, they tripped and fell and his uh, back was broken, and he was lame. He couldn't walk. Both of his legs were, uh, were lame. And so he's this lame kid who grows up in obscurity, living, hiding, hoping no one would ever, ever, ever figure out who he was. And then one day in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David has this thought. He says, are there anybody from the line of Saul and Jonathan that I might find them and be able to bless them? And somebody says, yeah, there's this one kid, Mephibosheth. And so David says, go get him and bring him to me. And Mephibosheth shows up at David's, David's palace, fear and trembling. He believes this is it. They found me. I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. And David says, Mephibosheth, I'm going to give you all of the land that belonged to your father, your Saul, meaning his lineage. I'm going to, give you, I'm going to bless you tremendously. And then he says, I'm going to also give you workers who are going to work the land for you because you can't, right? He's, he's lame. And you know what? You're going to eat at my table, David says. This is a crazy, crazy picture of the gospel. You are Mephibosheth. You're lame. 
You can't walk. You can't do anything to, to help yourself or save yourself. And the king who should kill you adopts you and brings you in as his own and seats you at his table. He says, I'm going to treat you like my son, not my enemy. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, mind-blowing picture of the grace of God. There's a, a song written by John Mark McMillan called Carbon Ribs, and it's written around this, this biblical story. And the chorus says this. It says, because I'm a dead man now with a ghost who lives within the confines of these carbon ribs, and one day when I'm free, I will sit. The cripple at your table. The cripple by your side. I can, I can barely read those words without tears coming to my eyes because that's me. I don't deserve anything good from God. But, but he, puts, he lets me sit at his table. It's, it's mind-blowing. And, and if that's you, I want to ask you to do something crazy today. I want to ask you to give your life to Jesus. If you realize that that's me and I need to, I need to dedicate my life to Jesus, I want, I want to ask you to be bold and to give yourself over to him completely. Stop wrestling with it. Stop, stop arguing with God over it. Just dedicate your, be fully into Jesus. He paid everything for you. He's not looking to smash you and crush you. He's looking to adopt you as his own. He wants to make you his own. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, do that now. As an act of faith and obedience, just cry out to him and he'll, he'll save you. Maybe you've understood this, all this as religious stuff before, and maybe you've gone through the motions, but you've never really placed your faith in Jesus. Today's the day. Maybe you need to come back. Maybe today's the day where you've got to come back to Jesus. And I would encourage you, don't, don't go out of here without doing business with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for the chance to study it together. We pray that you would help us to honor and bless your name, that you would be glorified among us, that we would submit ourselves to you knowing that you're so good. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.